welcome back to the show gerard thank you we ended the previous session bashing the education system <laughs> so it's only fair that we start this conversation doing the same you had mentioned about how there is more wisdom in the in a dictionary than most of our educational textbooks do you mind elaborating certainly while bashing the education system is very correct i do it a good deal of the time without apology uh there's a purpose that i do it for it is perhaps to put things in perspective for young people i wish that young people distinguish between the kind of education system we have and what education really is the dictionary was my first source of reference thanks to my mother who would never give me the meaning of a word but the source where i could get the meaning of all words so it's a book that is very dear to me in my younger days long before the internet i would never read even a novel without the dictionary next to me there will always be two books one is the book i'm reading the other is the dictionary because any time i didn't understand the meaning of a word i would go back to the dictionary that piece of wisdom has remained with me throughout today of course you have uh, online dictionaries and it has developed my vocabulary as well as uh, given me a deeper understanding of what i read now when i went into business when i went into teaching investment and finance many times textbooks are so needlessly complex i wanted something simple also the finest books on investment that i have read are inherently simple the authors keep repeating that simplicity is the key to success in investing and that is what i generally teach so i sometimes for investment terms i thought why not we fall back on the dictionary and even the very simple terms like e- investment what is investment in my presentations i have taken it from the dictionary not from a finance book what is investment what is insurance all from the dictionary so when it came to my having to critique the education system i thought let's try to understand what education is or at least what education should be and then i thought can we go back to the dictionary and start at the very beginning and i have carried with me the the dictionary definition of education let me read it for you education is the act or process of imparting or acquiring useful general knowledge developing the powers of reasoning and judgment and generally of preparing oneself or others intellectually for mature life brilliant no educationist that i know of at least has been able to define education so well it's so beautiful it's a long sentence i do agree but let me just read it once more and then we will contrast it and change this very definition to reflect what's happening in education today the kind of education you and i unfortunate commerce students have have experienced education is the act or process of imparting or acquiring that is very important no one has a monopoly over education i can educate myself so imparting or acquiring useful general knowledge that yes. is the key word next developing the powers of reasoning and judgment and generally of preparing oneself or others intellectually for mature life that is unavailable in art college so let us play with words here and see whether you'll agree with me about what has happened in the kind of educational environment we have experienced 
Education is the act or process of only imparting. It's a lecture format everywhere. Useless general knowledge. <laughs> Completely destroying the powers of reasoning and judgment because it's only rote learning by hearting. And ensuring that one is completely unemployable and hopelessly unprepared intellectually or otherwise for any kind of life, least of all mature life. So you know the kind of value that I find in a book like the dictionary. If nothing else, it so clearly defines and distinguishes between what education should be and what education is. Yes. Now the government has woken up and we do have a new revolutionary education policy. But if you think I'm jumping for joy, I'm not. I do not think all those new revolutionary ideas in the new education policy are going to survive a contact with the educational bureaucracy and the kind of vested interests we have in the educational system. I hope I am wrong for our young people. For the sake of our young people, I do hope I am wrong. So what happens is, from what I have noticed about education, I have a particular term for it. Our run-of-the-mill educational institutions are producing masses of youngsters whom I can only call the educated uneducated. The educated, uneducated. They have got something, mm. some power of memorization. But when they come into real life, they are lost. They are not prepared for it at all. Take engineering. Engineering colleges, once the politicians got involved in them, once they spread like wildfire, thinking that it is easy money. Today, there are educational inst uh, engineering institutions that are shut down. Others are used as warehouses. When I was a kid, maybe between the ages of, let's say, seven or eight and even uh, uh, college, the real brains would go into medicine or engineering. This was back in the 70s. Uh, in the, I was born in 63, yes, the 70s. Maybe even into the 80s. Okay. The real brains would go into engineering and medicine. And the word, he is an engineer. We would step back and take a deep breath and give him a long look of admiration. Mm. An engineer meant something. I know personally, people in my own circle, mechanical engineers who have passed recently with distinction, unable to get any job, unable to get a job for 8,000 or 10,000 rupees, going to companies and begging of them, we are prepared to work free for a year or two. Why? Just, we don't want salary. Just give us a certificate. Okay, the man has a year of experience. The man has two years of experience after we have actually worked for you free. This demeaning of education that should actually carry value is my main quarrel against the educational system. And uh, I'm happy to see that uh, in our own circle, there are people who are Realizing that, in my career of 36 years, whether when I started business at the age of 22 or even today, no one has asked me for my educational qualifications. And you and I know that in this very room, we have a youngster called Siddharth, who is too shy probably to come on camera, but who is looking after our whole technical aspects here. I didn't know this guy till a week ago. Today, he's a hero of mine. <laughs> Why is he a hero? The guy drops out of the formal education system at the age of probably 18, when he has completed his second PUC, knowing or, or understanding that there is no way this system can add value to what he wants to do. 12 years have passed since then. Quick review of Siddharth's life as he told it to me. 18, he decides no more studies in any formal educational institution. Takes a year off. By himself, masters website designing 
and a few other aspects of technology. I'm not very good at that. And for the last 11 years, the man has been working as an independent entrepreneur, earning his own money and learning along the way, learning on the job, learning experientially. I'm ter terribly jealous of Siddharth. So am I. That makes two of us. Yes. Now, I'm so jealous because the guy beat me by three years. I dropped out after the, after the BCom because my parents wanted me to get a degree of some sort. I would have happily dropped out at his age. Mm. So, like I said, this program is being shot in color. I'm actually turning green with envy here. <laughs> Maybe this section should be in black and white. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so this is what I said. And, and an American thought leader of the, I think, the 19th century, Robert Green Ingersoll, he says, it is a thousand times better to have common sense without education than to have education without common sense. Yes. So the message that I want to give you as I answer that question is, very simple. The dictionary says that education is not just imparting, it is also acquiring useful general knowledge. No educational institution has a monopoly over education. Mm. And that's why I gave you in the last uh, session that we had, the five greatest educational institutions in this world, the dictionary, the encyclopedia, a library, mm. a bookstore, and a Siddharth will testify, internet resources. Yes, of course. A uh, very re relevant follow-up question to that. Entrepreneurship or employment? Very relevant. What's your advice for young folks? Very relevant, very relevant. Thank you, because I'm on familiar ground here. Not only have I been an entrepreneur for 36 years, I'm also a first-generation entrepreneur. We did not have the good fortune of stepping into an established family business. In some ways, in many ways, I'm happy about it. We started something new in a line that we liked. For young people, as you asked, don't plunge into entrepreneurship. You should have the aptitude for entrepreneurship. You should have that spark in you. Entrepreneurship is not for everyone. The message I want to give is, there are such a large number of talented, dynamic young people who could be first-rate entrepreneurs in their own right. But because parents or some other people tell them business is risky, or for some other reason, they take up employment. Now, those people constitute a tragedy. A huge tragedy. A huge tragedy. You have no idea how you, huge it is. Because India does not need more Ambani's and Birla's and Tata's and Adani's. India needs a large number of small entrepreneurs. Secondly, I was forced to prepare a presentation on entrepreneurship and to teach entrepreneurship as part of a course simply because there is such a wrong notion about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship does not mean investing or borrowing and investing tens of crores of rupees and putting up big factories and plants. Those are very risky things and best left to the big boys. Entrepreneurship means Take somebody like you, you can speak well. You have the power to convince, converse, to speak in public. Somebody like you makes a career out of either these kind of uh, events, or you take up event management on a very low scale, or you're a very good MC or a compare here and there, and you manage to earn a living out of it. You're an entrepreneur. Now take our friend Siddharth. Siddharth, for the last 11 years, has been an entrepreneur. I told you, I'm still green with envy. Because I started business at 22. This guy started at 19. He's beaten my, by me by a whole three years. And the guy is happy with what he's doing. And that's why he's doing it. He is working in a line that he likes. 
When I was in college, I was fortunate to come across a saying by the Chinese philosopher Confucius. And the saying is very simple, and it sums up my whole philosophy of entrepreneurship. If you truly love what you are doing, you will never have to work a single day of your life. Okay, so if you can get into something that you like, make a living out of it, monetize your hobbies, your interests, if you can do that, you will live quite a healthy and happy life with less stress. Because when you constantly indulge in your passion or your interest, if at all stress is caused, it is positive stress. It is not negative mm, stress. Yes. You, you will agree because you would have experienced some of uh, both negative stress from and, positive stress. and positive stress. Yes. Okay, so if you truly love what you are doing, you will never have to work a single day of your life. And I am lucky that I got into a line that I like. 36 years later, let me tell you, when I entered my office this morning at about 8 o'clock, there was no difference in the enthusiasm with which I entered that office when you compare it to the 21st of October 1985. It sounds like you're describing a very happy marriage. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, that's the accusation I have from my wife too, uh, that I love my business sometimes more than her. <laughs> uh, okay, yes. So, uh, this is the passage that I gave. If more and more people can start skill-based entrepreneurship, mm. take Siddharth. Siddharth has not put up factories. Siddharth has not sunk in tons of money into, you know, gigantic plants. He is doing his work at his level. He has got people who find value in his services. He is constantly improving. He is educating himself. As Mark Twain says, I am one of those who never let their schooling interfere with their education. Right. <laughs> so I'm one of those who says that my education started the moment I finished my final BCom last examination. That's okay. when education started. Of course, it's happened along the way also. Because like I said, the college at which I studied, you and I studied both at St. Aloysius. It had in those days, and if I'm not mistaken, it still has, a first-rate program of extracurricular activities. And there were some great teachers who encouraged us those days, who told us openly that, you know, this is education, not what you're learning in class, even those days. And I salute those men and women. I do. I do. So that is what has really helped us, me. Mm. So where entrepreneurship is concerned, if a young person is passionate about something, then make use of things like those five great educational institutions I described to simply attempt to be the best in the world. Let that be the goal. Okay. Doesn't matter where you reach. But goal should be, if, if it's photography that interests me, okay, here I am, an 18-year-old, and I want to be the world's best photographer. How do I get there? That's all. Your best friends in life are many times a single sheet of blank paper and a pencil. I use that even today. If I have to think of something, I'll sit, pen and sheet of paper. That's all. Just two dots. This is where I am. This is where I want to go. Here is my problem. I want a solution. What is the solution? How do I get there? I'm passionately interested in photography. I want to be the best photographer in the world. This is my journey. What are the steps along the way? Yes. Work that out and tackle one at a time. Um, do we need a sense of uh, rebellious nature in order to become a successful uh, entrepreneur? Uh, I will not use the word confession or confess. I'll proclaim it. I will proclaim to you that since my childhood, I have been an unrepentant and unapologetic rebel and non-conformist. And that is one of the key reasons for me to reach where I've reached today. I think it's an essential part of success. 
You should be. One of my all-time favorite sayings in this world is by the Irish playwright uh, George Bernard Shaw. He says, if I remember the words correctly, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to make the world adapt to him. Yes. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Okay, what I find is today, because our education system destroys minds. It destroys mind. I'm not finding those youngsters with the kind of drive that is required to start something on their own. That challenge, that drive, I'm finding them very laid back, too pampered, just not able to forge ahead on their, try something new. There's an age at which you can take risk. And believe me, this whole question of risk is, I think, much ballyhooed. When you are starting out with an entrepreneurial activity that's based on your skills, where is the big risk? If you're a very good MC and, you, and you're just getting paid for, for doing those, what is the risk here? I think we've been conditioned to think that Conditioned, way. no doubt. So we have to step out of it. We have to step out of it. Hmm. What inspired your rebellious nature at such a young age? <laughs> Maybe I'm just a bad fellow. <laughs> <laughs> we are all mad fellows. <laughs> mad and bad. Yeah, okay. uh, rebel, what inspired my rebellious nature? Um, I have had the good fortune of having one or two members in the family who were also such people. And uh, while they were not great uh, speech makers, on a one-to-one -one basis, they were extremely intelligent, very good conversationalists. And they put some of these ideas in my head, although there was decades of age gap between them and me. And uh, I was, I would say, fortunate enough to see the value in what they were saying. For example, a very revered uncle of mine, who's no more now, of course. He gave me that fantastic philosophy about life. And that one philosophy has helped me manage stress throughout my life. My students will wince now because they have heard this a thousand times. But it's so important that I'm going to tell you this philosophy again. It's very simple. It's about three or four lines. There are a zillion things we can't control. There are a handful of things that we can control. Stop worrying about the zillion things you can't control. Focus on the handful of things that you can control. This, that's all that's required. This reminds me of uh, a Venn diagram that you always exhibit in your course. Uh, things that matter and things that you can control. control. Yes. And where the two <laughs> intersect. Yes. You have real progress. Yes, absolutely. So even today, all the time, uh, people come to me with their problems. I just take that pen and paper and note down, oh, these are the issues. As I'm noting down, my mind is working. Now this person whom I'm going to advise. Issue number one, can he or she control it or not? Number two, can we control it? Number three, I tell them straight, listen, you're worried about this. What's the use of worrying when you can't control it? So you've got 10 issues. There's only two issues which you can control. Let's start working there. It's worked so beautifully. I always apologize because this is one thing I keep repeating. Immediately, it's not just that you can make progress. It also reduces stress. Very important in this stressful world. We are worrying about billions of things, billions of things. Most of those, the overwhelming majority of those, we just cannot control. All we have to do is, okay, let's see, what can I do? Where do I have an iota of control? Let me start work there. 
So you stop wasting time worrying unnecessarily. Focus on what we can. Draw up those plans. Keep thinking about those. That's very important. Okay. I'm going to ask you a few, few vague questions now. No. Okay. What is wealth? <laughs> wealth, happiness, yeah, these are things that uh, are different for different people. For me, wealth mean, is a means to an end. It is not something to be kept on in some holy place and worshipped. It's a means to an end. If a reasonable amount of wealth enables you to live a successful, comfortable, happy life, if it enables you to leave this world a little better than you found it, if it enables you to develop a good philosophy, something like what the medical professionals have, first to do no harm, Okay, try to harm no one. If possible, try to help someone. I think uh, in many ways, that is wealth. I think we discussed last time the concept of financial freedom, where I work because I want to, not because I have to. Wealth is important to get to that point. Wealth is very important to get to that point. So, can money actually buy happiness? It can. Let nobody fool you by giving you all those moralistic <laughs> uh, philosophy that uh, try telling that to a real poor person. Oh, yeah. Try, it's, easy, it's easy to come out with such rubbish hmm. when you're sitting on tons of money in the bank. I usually hear that from upper middle class people. Money can't buy happiness. You'll only hear it from there. Yeah, okay. You'll only hear it from there. I will focus on how to get the people who need to get wealthy to need to, uh, you know, to actually get wealthy, to make the journey. I would rather focus on, on that. So happiness, wealth, all these things mean different things to different people. A person who has one square meal a day, if he graduates to two square meals a day, it is happiness. If he reaches a position where he has all three meals, he'll probably feel wealthy. He'll probably say, you know, a year back I was poor. But by even a middle class standard, they would consider him uh, poor. But he has grown in wealth. Wealth could also mean the independence to pursue your own interests. Everyone has heard of Warren Buffett. His partner is Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger is now in his mid-90s, but still attends office every day. Like I said, he, is, <laughs> he loves what he does, obviously. Charlie Munger also would be one of the richest uh, men in the world. And he has this saying. He says, I did not intend to get rich. I wanted to get independent. I think there's a wealth of wisdom behind those words. So wealth is the side effect of uh, pursuing independence. Yes. You need a certain amount of wealth to be independent. And independence also means financial independence. When you have to stop worrying about financial independence, it can spur you on to great things, either in work or in life, even in doing good, even in doing charity, even in doing so many things. Remember that the world's largest philanthropists have been entrepreneurs. So there can be a lot of people who moralize, who preach long sermons, that doesn't fill stomachs. That doesn't pay for, for education. But the world's greatest universities, some of the very large endowments, some of the very large charities have been funded in, when you're talking about tens, hundreds of millions of dollars, several billions of dollars. It's come from the entrepreneurs, not the socialists. Okay, so do you think socialism is detrimental to our progress? Not at all. Not at all. You need people who will point out areas that need to be addressed. Who will bring to the fore issues that may otherwise get hidden. I'm all for good activism. 
I'm also for socialism, especially when certain important areas of governance that need to be managed properly can be brought to the attention of a government. I'm against socialism acting as some kind of crimping effect on enterprise and business. Like I told you, it also depends on what we mean by socialism. What I mean by socialism, may, may somebody else may uh, have a different opinion of it. To give you an example, I told you that we do not need the very large industrialists. If we have them and they are doing good, fine. But what India needs is a large number of small entrepreneurs. I think that's a socialist idea. A large number of small entrepreneurs, young people who do not seek and do not depend only on jobs, jobs, jobs all the time, on employment. Young people who in humble callings, in skill-based callings, can make a living on their own. I think this is a socialist idea, not a capitalist idea. But when we think of socialism, we think of uh, because, guaranteed jobs and handouts. Yeah, handouts. And, uh, there's a large moral hazard there. Okay. There's a very large moral hazard there. Okay? Because we may grow up thinking that the world owes us a living. It's not so. It's not so. Take it for someone from someone who's been in business for 36 years as a first generation entrepreneur. We know how hard it is. So, the whole uh, aspect is if you take a country like India, what is India? If you see the enormous diversity that you have in a country like India, it is difficult to call India a country. India is a continent. I always say India is a continent masquerading as a country. There is more diversity in India than, say, in the United States. Now, if we can harness this, this diversity is a gigantic human resource. But unfortunately, no government that has ever ruled India or governed India since independence has been really able to harness this human resource and push it forward economically. This is the tragedy. That's why even today, such a large number of people remain what we call below the poverty line, have no direction, have access to very poor quality education. And that has a cascading effect as they, as they progress through life. I have to ask you a, a moral question because we spoke about morality. Uh, how much of financial greed do you think is necessary in life and when does it qualify as excessive and dangerous? Correct. It's a good question, actually. It's a very good question. Because a lot of us confuse issues. Let me see if I can bring a little clarity. Greed or anything in excess is bad. It is not the greed. It is the excess excessive wanting of something. Normal greed, all of us are greedy. If you or I are not greedy, I don't think we are human beings. I'm prepared to go to a notary and swear an affidavit that I am greedy and I'm prepared to sign it there. I'm greedy. I think all of us are greedy. This is uh, built into a human being. The whole issue is control. Greed by itself is not bad. Because greed can manifest itself in very acceptable and desirable forms. At a lower level, it can be a simple desire, an aspiration. I want to improve. Uh, it can be enthusiasm. It can kindle a certain amount of enthusiasm, ambition, drive, which can result in one day innovation. This is all good. This is all good. Now, excessive greed, where I want to get rich quick. But can we? You can get poor quick. <laughs> I still remember 
a client of mine. Of course, he's a good client, a long-term investor. I think he was trying to pull my leg when he dropped into my office about a fortnight ago. So quietly before leaving, he asked me, tell me, do you have any scheme where one rupee becomes 10 rupees? <laughs> so I told him, no, but I can show you several schemes where 10 rupees becomes one rupee. <laughs> so this get-rich-quick uh, attitude that we have is excessive greed. Mm -hmm. It's not normal greed. It's excessive greed. Now, when we talk about greed, unfortunately, greed has become a bad word today. <laughs> He's greedy, you are, it's a rather disparaging remark. But greed is a very wide term. A low level of greed, where I would not even use the term greed. I would use the term drive, ambition, desire. And certain types of greed can be, can be good. We are so used to thinking in very blinkered terms. If I have a tremendous greed to do good. Now suddenly greed does not sound so bad, does it? No. Nope. So I have a tremendous greed for knowledge. Okay, we may use a different term from greed, but supposing I'm to use this so-called bad word, greed. I'm greedy for knowledge. I'm greedy for self-improvement. I have a greed to actually teach or help others or mentor others. Well, it's not so bad. You can have certain passion. I have a greed for music. You like a particular type of music and you have a greed for it. It gives you... Greed is not the apt term to use there, but I'm just trying to give you the idea that when you say greed, greed can also be for... You may have strong desires to aspire to certain things which need not be bad at all. But excessive greed, when it comes to my wanting to do you harm to make myself rich, enrich myself at your expense, it's bad. I would certainly define that as bad. If I'm going to cause harm to somebody in order to enrich myself, if I'm going to cheat somebody, if I'm going to resort to sharp practice in order to get a lot of money, if I'm going to take from someone that person's rightful share either in an inheritance or in, in anything else. It's not good. Okay. Uh, we spoke about get rich quick. Uh, a lot of people invest in unstable instruments with the intention of getting rich quick. One of those instruments uh, is derivatives. Mm. What is your opinion on investing in derivatives? Can I invest in derivatives? First and foremost, you cannot invest in derivatives. Okay. Derivatives are leveraged products. Okay. Okay, you use a basic underlying security to give yourself a lot of leverage. All the great financial bust-ups have been because of leverage. And you can speculate in derivatives. Uh, there are these class of uh, derivatives traders. See, nobody likes to be called a speculator, just like nobody likes to be called greedy. I take offense. Uh, Nobody likes to be called a speculator. I'm always an investor. I may be doing the opposite of investment, but I'm an investor. I want to call myself an investor. But if you actually look at derivatives trading worldwide today, I will not even say 99%, I'll say 100% of it is not used for its original purpose, which was hedging, <laughs> lowering risk. 100% of derivatives trading in the world today is used for pure and simple speculation. That is why Warren Buffett called derivatives a financial weapon of mass destruction. And he also said derivatives are like hell, easy to get in, but impossible to get out. <laughs> so uh, I would certainly refrain from this kind of activity. Okay, you would advise against it. Very definitely, yes. And what about uh, chit funds? Uh, chit funds is interesting to analyze because the basic principle of chit funds is cooperation. A number of people get together. They are divided into two categories. Those who have money, those who need money. 
So you are trying to, what you call your peer-to-peer lending kind of thing, you are trying to do it in the old uh, uh, crude form. My problem is that the structure of a chit fund is not good. Why is it not good? Let's say there are 100 people contributing 1,000 rupees each, so you've got 100,000 chit, that's a 1 lakh chit per month. Now, that 1 lakh has to be invested somewhere to earn money. And the mode of investment there is to auction that 1 lakh to one of the members of the chit who needs the money. Now, let us say, 100 people have contributed 1,000 rupees and here's your lakh of rupees. 80 people are investors. 20 people need money. When 20 people need money, their need for that money will vary. Some will want it badly. Some will want it if the rate of interest is fine. How does the auction take place? You quote prices for that chit of 1 lakh. So let us say I quote 95,000 rupees. What it means is if it's a one-year chit, and this is the first month, I take 95,000 from you. In the course of this year, I'm going to pay you back 100,000. The 5,000 rupees is the interest that I'm paying the chit, which will be distributed among the investors. Now, when I quote 95,000, if the next guy who wants it more desperately than me, what will he do? He will quote 94,000. This is where you auction by lowering the prices. So the interest increases, the rate of interest. Somebody else will quote 90,000. So now we have reached a stage where the banks are giving you five, five and a half percent, but here's almost a, roughly, I'm, for easy understanding, 10%. Actually, it's more when you calculate it mathematically. Somebody much more desperate than that will quote 88, 85. Suddenly, you'll get someone who'll take it for something like 80,000. And this guy is actually paying 20, 25% of interest. Look at how a bank lends. You send in an application. You'll have to fill up forms after forms. You'll have to convince the bank why you need this money. The bank is very interested in security. What kind of security are you giving for this money? The bank will come to a point where it almost should be convinced that you don't need the money and then it'll give it to you. Collateral security, guarantors, this, that. So multi-layered. And yet the banks have what we call non-performing assets. And in the case of public sector undertaking banks, at least they are very, very worrying in today's scenario. But the fact remains that bankers follow prudential norms of lending. In the CHIT fund, examine the structure because examining structure is very important in life. What am I doing in a chit fund? I am giving it to the most desperate borrower. The most desperate borrower, is he likely to be a good candidate for repayment or a potential defaulter? A potential defaulter. It is as if I'm trying to identify the non-performing asset mm. and then giving the money there. Two people that I know have committed suicide because of chit funds. And one person has gone bankrupt and is absconding because of chit funds. These are people I knew. And they're actually, as persons, they were good chaps. So when we talk about entrepreneurship, I would say don't get into this kind of entrepreneurship. It should be your own skill-based uh, thing rather than... Uh, yes. It goes back to our financial greed and how much is good and how much is excessive. Uh, speaking of uh, unstable instruments to invest in, and this is a highly requested question, mm. what is your opinion on investing in cryptocurrencies? Oh, cryptocurrencies. Yeah, bitcoins and others. You know, this uh, famous comedian, I, uh, John Oliver, I think his name is, he says, that he has got a definition of bitcoins. He says that cryptocurrencies in general are everything you don't understand about money <laughs> Can, uh, you know, uh, what shall I say, combined with everything you don't understand about computers. This is Bitcoin. Everything you don't understand about money combined with everything you don't understand about computers. Uh, if you want a short and simple answer, you cannot invest in Bitcoins. 
I really admire one of the students, my former students whom I mentored a little bit. And today the guy is a brilliant investment uh, professional. Now, this guy told me in an email, a client asked him once, can I invest in Bitcoin? His answer was brilliant. I always quote it. No, you cannot invest in Bitcoin. You can only speculate in Bitcoin. Now, understanding that difference could be useful. Because cryptocurrency, a currency, I always ask the question, you live your life, I live mine. Take the millions of people that we have in India. Without having Bitcoin in your digital wallet, are you telling me that you can't live your life? I can right now. <laughs> okay. But when the future comes, does it pass the economic tests of a currency? This is what we'll have to see. Mm. Remember that we have had a case in the past where Bitcoin surged to something like 19000 or $20,000 and then fell, I think, all the way down to $5,000 or $6,000. Now it's more than 50000 again. Okay. Yes, it's fifty eight. But Warren Buffett once again has referred to Bitcoins as rat poison. Mm. The point is, it's $50,000, $57,000, $58,000. I am aware of what it, uh, the price is. What is it? Can anybody explain to me where it derives sanction? Because a currency has to have a sanction. You, you want to know what Bitcoin is. Take your 100 rupee note from your wallet and read it. I promise to pay the bearer. It's a, 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 we call it currency. It's nothing but a bearer instrument. It's a bearer instrument that has a, a value. And it's printed there that I promise to pay the bearer mm. the sum of rupees 100. And there's the signature of the governor of the Reserve Bank of India. But the value of that 100 rupee note can be devalued as a result of inflation. Absolutely and correct. We know for a fact that this year, a lot of big governments are printing excessive amount of True. cash. True. But uh, with Bitcoin, that issue does not arise because after a while, they're going to stop uh, creating more Bitcoins. Yes. But what if a situation worse than what happened about seven or eight years ago happens again? In that case, Bitcoin fell from 20,000 to 5,000. Now, while inflation does devalue the your money, that kind of devaluation takes place, especially in large, diverse economies like India, mm. takes place at a certain rate. At times, you may have high inflation, 10, 11, 12%. At times, you, have, you may have relatively low inflation of 5, 6, 7%. But the moment inflation goes up, the governments will take strong steps to try to curb inflation because mm. if inflation remains high, they are going to lose in elections. True. Also, Today, in the world, including in India, you have options for investing internationally. You have options for investing which are based or counted in dollar terms, in other currency terms. There are ways of diversifying and hedging your investment portfolio. Secondly, there are good avenues like real estate. I'm not saying physical real estate, even real estate investment trusts, that is the real estate version of mutual funds, mm. which you can, you, any normal person, normal middle class person can invest in. You have also the stock market, simple products like index funds, where with a few thousand rupees, you can take ownership stakes in the top 50 companies, top 100 companies in India. Now, when such avenues are available, I would not advocate mm. going into something as risky as Bitcoin. You have to remember one thing in any bubble. The bubble bursts when the maximum number of lambs are ready for the slaughter. Not before that. Whether in the stock market or the property market or anywhere else. If you remember, the bubble we had in 
real estate between 2003 and 2013. For 10 years, prices went up. At least in Mangalore, property went up by 10 times in 10 years. If some land was 2 lakhs percent, it went to 20 lakhs percent. That is huge in a period of 10 years. By the time we came to the last year, which was 2013, 2012, 2013, there were learned articles being published and experts sprang up in real estate from nowhere, telling people that real estate is not going to come down at all. Prices are not going to come down at all. And when we look back today, we are into our eighth year of recession in the real estate market. So these things move in cycles. Getting caught at the wrong point of a bubble can be very, very risky. But if you are going to use Bitcoin as a currency, it should have the features of a currency. Many times it does not. Also, I'm sure you're aware, it's one of the most environmentally unfriendly operations. Bitcoin mining consumes humongous amounts of power power on servers and other things. And this kind of power in a single Bitcoin transaction that you need is, I'm afraid, something that I would not uh, be supportive of from the environmental point of view, if you have... Uh... So there are, there are many, uh, many reasons why. If your viewers want to have a glance at a simple two-page note that I have prepared on cryptocurrencies, they are most uh, welcome to contact you. And if anybody asks you for it, let me know. I will share. Sure. Uh, we'll put the link to that article uh, on our page. Or... Most welcome. Okay. I'll be happy to share it. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about national economy because we spoke about inflation. Yes. Uh, our GDP growth has fallen consistently over the past few years. And this has been uh, compounded by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Is our economy in dire straits? Once again, a good question, Pratham. See, after the real estate boom ended in 2013, 2014, 15, 16, during those three years, we woke up to the fact that banks, uh, leading banks in India, are being faced with the challenge of serious non-performing assets. Unfortunately, this was not addressed. They kept kicking the can down the road. Even to this day, it, is, it has not been addressed. So this threat is hanging over the economy. It has been hanging over the economy for a very long time. Uh, certain financial institutions went bust like ILNFS, followed by Divan Housing Finance. Public sector banks are sitting on huge NPS, some of them not even fully reflected in their balance sheets. And this is a great cause for concern. The economy started doing badly from those years, 14, 15, 15, 16 onwards. And uh, long before COVID, we have not had a satisfactory economic situation in the country. Somehow, the central issues that could spur growth have not been addressed. Now, of course, it's easy to blame COVID. But COVID was only a further tipping point. COVID by itself, if we study history, it is not the first pandemic. Pandemics will pass. We are now in the throes of the second wave. There could be a third wave. But two or three years from the time it started, we have finished one year already. Another year, two years, COVID will be behind us. When the economy gets a shock like that, you will have a bad economy for a year or two or three. This year's budget, which I analyzed separately, has responded pretty well by 
pumping money into infrastructure to the COVID situation. But the whole problem in India has not so much been at the policy level as the implementation level. Policy directions have been good even in the past, to some extent, not always. But the good policies never got implemented. Therefore, we didn't have good outcomes. The tragedy of India is that real reforms take place only when we have a huge crisis. At other times, it's politics. It's not economics. And right now, we have a good crisis. We have a good crisis. And that's why you had a, what I would term, under the circumstances, a good budget. But a good budget is only words printed on paper. Will we have a good outcome? Will the disinvestment and privatization targets of the government be met? Will the hundreds of thousands of crores that the government intends to spend on infrastructure actually be spent at the last mile? Or will there be what is euphemistically called leakages along the way? So these are the issues that have plagued this unfortunate country for a very long time. So the problem is with implementation. Implementation. Okay. Always. Always. It's with implementation. That's why I have not got overly uh, enthused even about the new educational policy. I do not know whether it will be implemented in true spirit. If it does, good for the young people here. But if it does not, then the bright young people will still be looking to leave India, study abroad, and if possible, blossom in an environment that is conducive to their abilities and their intellect. <sighs> yeah. Mm, and we know through this budget that uh, the percentage of our fiscal deficit has also increased yes. significantly. Yes. What does this mean to a common individual like me and the country as a whole? A healthy fiscal deficit is generally 3% of GDP. Mm. India has never achieved that in living memory. But we were, we were journeying towards it. And if you see the budget estimates for the financial year gone by, 19, I'm sorry, 2021, it was supposed to be 3.5%, which is not far away from 3%. But it turned out, thanks to COVID, that it shot up to 9.5%. Now, that is huge and that is bad. But when you're confronted with a once-in-a-century event like the COVID-19 pandemic, that kind of running, that kind of fiscal deficit for a year or two is fine, so long as then there is a plan to once again get back on track. That by itself is not worrying. That by itself is not worrying. The high fiscal deficit just for a year or two, a consistently high fiscal deficit with no thought to, to prudent spending, to what they call, you know, budgetary responsibility, fiscal responsibility, with no thought to that at all. That is bad. But that was not what the government was doing. With every passing year, the government was trying to get back on track. So we were having a slow journey towards that three per magical 3% mark. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has intervened and for that, we cannot really blame the government. And the government has to take, as they say in English, uh, desperate situations call for desperate measures. So there I'm okay. We'll have to watch what happens in the two budgets that come after this, the budgets of uh, 22 and 23. So if we are able to implement government projects satisfactorily, it could once again kickstart economic activity, second wave notwithstanding. Okay. Um, let's get back to you for a moment. Me? Yes. Uh, you have been in the investment management business since 1985. Yes. How did you manage to stay the course? Oh, that was not difficult. Because uh, I got, I was fortunate to be a first generation entrepreneur in a line that I love. If you truly love what you are doing, you will never have to work, work a single day of your life. So when you're into that kind of a thing, 
I don't think, ask any photographer who has been in business for uh, three decades. I don't think uh, they will find that uh, difficult to explain. Ask somebody who's been really interested in breeding animals. Uh, somebody who has been in the music industry. Uh, somebody who has been in anything. Our friend Siddharth. Uh, may he grow old very slowly. He's 30 now. But if you ask him at the age of 60, he'll probably be keeping in touch with a lot of techno technology-based uh, stuff. And uh, he will tell you that uh, he's already been in business for 11 years. At the age of 30, to have 11 years of business experience under your belt is commendable. Commend I'm still green with envy, by the way. So, <laughs> so it's commendable. So I don't think, uh, if you ask him, because somebody who's in, been in business for 11 out of his 30 years, 11 years he has stayed the course. I don't think he'll have a difficulty in answering. You can ask him another question also. Uh, do you see yourself in the same line in the next uh, decade or two? And I won't be surprised if the answer is yes, I don't see myself in any other line. You don't see yourself in any other line when you love the work you're doing. There's no need for you to quit. Siddharth, you have to show this podcast to your mom, okay, once we're done with this. <laughs> really, we, we need to, go, I think the three of us need to go grab a drink. You know, there was uh, one of my colleagues in the financial uh, uh, services business. as a lady who's got this 10 standard son. After all that bashing there of the education system that took place in your first mm -hmm. session, she says, I've carefully hidden this link from my son because he's preparing <laughs> for the SSLC exam. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so, you're a financial advisor from 9 to 5 on most days. Yeah, I keep my hours to a certain extent. Yes. A little longer than those hours. But okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So, when you go to weddings or functions or someone's roasts and you're just casually standing there with the glass in your hand and when some random guy comes to you and asks you for financial advice, do you get irritated? It once again depends who's asking. Mm -hmm. And uh, what the tone is and what the intent is behind that question. See, when you have been in the advising, teaching, mentoring business for a very long time, you generally develop a good deal of patience. Uh, most professionals, most good professionals are patient. I've seen even the busiest doctors who will take the time to explain to you your medical condition, who will spend time with you. So these are all great uh, uh, professionals. Uh, no, honestly, I don't get too irritated. I try to give a little bit of basic advice, but I also try to drive home a message that this may not be the appropriate place or occasion at which to try to get really valuable advice. So I would rather refer them. I said, if you want to be referred to a good uh, professional, uh, you can just message me and I'll give you the number since uh, my firm does not take new clients. So I'll always send you to some of my juniors, mm -hmm. uh, some brilliant people who have passed through my hands and doing so well today, can doing you, much better mm -hmm. than I was doing at their age. Let me, let me okay. tell you that. Do you have any juniors or students who have followed in your footsteps? At least 20. At least 20. Maybe more, I don't know but at least 20 who have been taught by me, who have interned at my office, who have started on their own once again as first-generation professionals. And one or two of them, let me mention names because I think we should mention names when they deserve that credit. A gentleman called Deepak K. Rao, who has his own uh, company today called Simplest Financial Consultancy Private Limited, offices in Bangalore and Mangalore one of India's largest mutual fund distributors uh, and one of my oldest interns because he interned with me, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in the year 2001. So 20 years have passed. He's built up such a beautiful business. But let me go beyond that. Deepak has done enormous good work in investor education. 100 hours of my lectures he carries online available to anybody free of charge. And uh, he conducts so many investor workshops and, uh, and other uh, 
accessions. So he's done some great work. So this is one name that really comes to my mind. There's a small little group of three mutual fund uh, distributors and investment professionals. Sapna Shenoy, uh, who had started out wanting to be a chartered accountant and then she changed tax. Uh, Elston Menezes and Yonel de Souza, they generally work together. Sapna, Yonel, Elston, they work together. And they work together, not in the, they have got their independent practices, but they work together in investor education. Uh, they, they conduct a number of investor workshops of varying lengths. And uh, I have invited them from this year to also give lectures in the course that I teach. And they are doing some marvelous work, both in their investment business as well as in teaching. Uh, similarly, uh, a few people who have left Mangalore and started individual careers even outside Mangalore. A few youngsters who have come from outside remained in Mangalore for eight months just to attend that course of mine and then gone on to become investment advisors. You were asking about happiness some time back, wealth, happiness. There's one more term which they don't teach you in uh, any business schools. It's called contentment. Contentment, satisfaction is something that I derive when I see these kind of youngsters. And I realize that in a very small way, I have played a role in their lives. And the fallout of that role has been positive. This is happiness. But let me tell you, I'm not being moralistic here. For me to experience this happiness and to recognize it as happiness, I must myself be comfortable financially. And because I am comfortable financially, I can enjoy these experiences much more. So let no one say, you know, while you wallow in poverty, you should have all these uh, things of happiness and the higher thing. No, it, that, all that, you know, try to peddle that to someone else. I will not uh, accept that. I always tell young people to judge your happiness, your sense of achievement. Forget your school and college examinations. They are not examinations, they are memory tests. There is only one examination that is relevant to all of us. And that is what I call the examination of life. You must have suffered through that <laughs> uh, lecture at least. It's very simple. If I'm on my deathbed, and at that moment I'm still capable of thinking, and my life plays like a movie that's being uh, rewound, am I happy with that life? If the answer is yes, I have passed the examination of life. That is the only examination that matters. So I'm, I'm truly happy to have mentored these people. I probably want to mentor more. Right now, there's a, there's a girl I'm trying to help. Let me not mention her name now. She wants to do her chartered accountant. I have picked her up as an intern, accepted her as an intern, simply for one quality that she exhibited when she was a student earnestness. I've seen it in very few. I've seen it in Deepak Rao. I've seen it in others. This girl's earnestness. When she was my student, maybe two years ago, I once went and asked her, what are you doing? She said, I'm a BCom student. I said, okay, you're a BCom student. But this girl is present in each and every class. That's why I asked her, what are you doing? I thought she was doing nothing. That's why she's attending classes. I said, yes, but you have uh, exams, don't you? Semester exams. And, uh, some of the other students don't attend these classes when they have those exams. She said, yes, but I want to attend these classes. So even if I have an exam next morning, I will sit in your class. Earnestness. She saw some value in that kind of uh, education. That earnestness. So I want to mentor her and I want to somehow ensure that she is a very successful young lady in a few years' time from now. Now, I can do this because I can afford to do it. <clears throat> uh, you know, there's great wisdom in when you take a flight. 
the security announcement that is just before the flight. I'm talking about the safety announcement pertaining to the oxygen masks. If you remember, the words go something like this. In the event of a fall in cabin pressure, oxygen masks will drop down automatically. Pull the mask towards you, probably fix it around your neck, fix the mask over your mouth and breathe normally. And then comes the most important sentence. First, fasten your own mask and then turn around to help people next to you. Because you can't help others if you can't if you are unable to help yourself first. True. Okay. So you studied, you thought, and you advised on finance and investment for almost four decades. So what next for Gerard Colasso? Staying the course. Staying the course. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are a couple of things which I'll share. I don't know whether I'll be able to do them. But let me tell you, I'm very, very happy staying the course. Uh, you know, when I teach, I talk about the investment tripod. That investment is for three purposes, for parking, for regular returns and for growth. Similarly, in my life, there have been three things which form a, what we call the opposite of a vicious circle. This is called a virtuous circle. One is reading. I am what I am because I read. The second is practice. I make a living out of it. And the third is teaching. Each one helps the other. You are a better practitioner and a teacher because you read. You are a better teacher because you read and you practice. So you bring a very strong element of realism, realistic examples to your teaching. And you are a better reader because you relate what you are reading to your own life and to your teaching. So it's a virtuous circle. One supports the other. So this helps me stay the course. And I want to continue with this as long as I can. So that is one thing. The other thing I want to do is, I want to, I want to continue trying to do some good for a few young people. Because the world today is loaded against young people. It's just so stressful for the young when we grew up 50 years ago, uh, life was not so fast. The term multitasking was not heard of. It was more relaxed. There's no doubt about that. It was less stressful as a, as a child. It was more enjoyable. The density of population, the kind of buildings you had, there was place to go out and play and fall down and get up and, and you know, Enjoy life as a child must, which sadly is uh, is disappearing today. Uh, I would like to do something for young people. We are already doing it. We are doing it at several levels. It's not just teaching and mentoring. We also, uh, in a small way, help people. I don't like to talk about the charity that we do, but a good deal of it is uh, for three sections of society. One is for young people and children. Second is for women. And the third is for the elderly. These are the three thrust areas. And we try to identify cases and, and help to a certain extent. That's something we want to continue doing. Uh, two things, if time permits, I don't know whether I'll be able to do that. I will not also deeply regret if I don't get the opportunity to do that because my normal work schedules are quite, quite uh, demanding. But one of the things that has helped me in life other than reading and uh, teaching and other things is that at a very young age, maybe at the age of even 12 or 13, thanks to some great teachers who could step out of the educational system and help a youngster, they helped me develop at least some basic public speaking and oral communication skills. That has helped me like nothing else because I'm in, a, I'm in a business where you have to communicate. You have to advise people. And the advice has to be effective. So uh, that has helped me such a lot. And when I look back on my own life, I'm so happy it happened when I was in the eighth standard. 
I think communication should be taught and a certain mastery over communication should be developed, not when we are in college. I think it should be early on, between the 7th or 8th standard and the 1st or 2nd PUC. Someday, if I can prepare a small curriculum of my own, based on my own experiences, based on what I remember that was taught to me or the training I got, I would like to do it absolutely free for these kids who are between the 8th standard, let's say, and the PUC. <clears throat> That's one thing. I've... And the last thing is, uh, by a lucky accident, at the age of 14, that's 44 years ago, I developed a taste for Western classical music. Something that has remained with me for 44 years and has enriched my life like very few other things. So even today, when I work alone, there's always classical music playing. When I'm on my walk, headphones, I listen to that. I've read about it. I cannot play a single instrument. I cannot read music. I have not been trained in anything. But I have enjoyed music for 44 years. I have also been able to give a few other people close to me a taste for this without forcing them to listen to it. And in the process, I've developed very easy techniques because the first thing is classical music, there's no tune in it. So I've been able to do that. Maybe someday if I have the time, I would like to make it a little more formal and take the help of maybe bright young people like you and let's not forget Siddharth. Uh, to perhaps course, yes. in small doses see whether we can we can give it not just Western classical music. It can be classical literature. It can be Indian classical music, Hindustani or Carnatic. I listen to Hindustani music also, but my knowledge of it is not as deep as uh, Western classical. But uh, something like that also I would like to do because in, in today's stressful life, this is a spiritually uplifting experience. And will that make you happy in your life? I'm happy as it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that will make me happier. Okay. Yes. Well, that concludes our podcast. Thank you so much. For I have enjoyed it. I didn't know when I came for my first session whether I would, because this is not something I, I generally do, but I could not refuse my former students. And you're one of them. So I was happy to do it. And let me tell you, when I conclude genuinely, I have enjoyed both these sessions. I only hope your viewers enjoy them. David, definitely Siddharth will. Siddharth will. Siddharth will, yes. Yes, thank you, Chirat. Most welcome.